It's a pleasure for me, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful to uh, Jay Caddy for bringing me and allowing me to uh, uh, tell my Martian uh, uh, adventures. So let's start. Um, hopefully it works. Maybe not. Is there anything I need to do differently? It's, uh, hold on a second. Good start. Okay. Here we go. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to tell you um, uh, about uh, our missions to Mars. Uh, in particular, the entry, descent, and landing part, which is the part that uh, I have uh, uh, concentrated on, in, and in, within that, with the guide navigation and control part of it. But I want to give you some scientific context around this so you can see the progression of the science goals and the, 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 the technology aspect, the engineering aspects. So why do we explore Mars? Well, we explore Mars because uh, there's plenty of evidence that Mars at one point, like 3.5 billion years ago, was a planet much like Earth. It was a, a warm and wet uh, you know, uh, planet, right, with plenty of rivers and oceans. And as you can see, for example, in this uh, 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 delta, you have a river that empties its contents into a bigger body of water and, you know, and it generates a delta, just like Earth. And there's, you know, thousands of, you know, uh, uh, of, of examples like that where geologists can tell you, look, that looks like water flowed on Mars. Not only that, but water was stable on Mars. I mean, that was the hypothesis, right? And therefore, the conditions for life might have arisen back then. And life might have uh, uh, originated on Mars and maybe even prospered, right? So, where, so the, the reason why we explore Mars is because we want to know whether there was life on Mars. And we want to know whether there was life on Mars because we want to know whether we are alone in the universe. As of today, the only place on the universe that, the phenom you know, that, uh, that we know that has life is Earth, period. And what better than go having our next you know, neighbor planet to go study this hypothesis and see whether life is just a cosmical coincidence that only happened on, on our beloved planet or is something that is all over the, the, the universe. Perhaps there's somebody, some corner of the universe giving a presentation just like this. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering whether we are here, right? So, so that's the reason for, for, for the study of Mars. The first mission that really, you know, tackled this, the astrobiology aspect of Mars was Viking. You know, it wasn't, I landed in 76. It was for me a tremendous, uh, I, mean, I follow it as a kid. Uh, very closely, it was an inspiration. This was a gigantic mission, okay? It was, a f of, in today's dollars, was a a above $5 billion. So it was the robotic equivalent of Apollo, okay? And these guys, they went for the big price, okay? They didn't want to see whether there were conditions. They went directly to detect life. So they have this miniaturized laboratory, extremely complex, to look for things that, uh, that uh, indicates life as we know it. So, they search for metabolic processes and photosynthesis. So, for example, they carry a, 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 a chicken soup, they used to call them, a nutrient laced with, uh, with radioactiv radioactivity, and so they feed it to the, you know, the so-called animals, and, and if they eat it, they would generate gases, just like we do. And then if you actually sense in the gases radioactivity, it meant that there was some life there converted those solids into gases, and then that would be a metabolic process. They did the same thing. With, uh, with photosynthesis, where they would put the radio radioactive stuff in the gases and see what they be became converting to solids. And they do that, and voila. They, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about that later. So then the, the landing system itself was also, the, you know, these guys had to pretty much invent it from scratch, okay? And it was a soft lander, okay? And it, uh, it has an entry, an egg, it, pretty much the, today we base all our landing systems on this technology from the entry capsule, uh, the shape of the entry capsule, the parachute. We're using still the Viking parachute to these days. It was a very costly, very difficult development. And then the soft lander. So this is pretty much, uh, and they had to invent their own radar, their own computers. It was, as I said, it was really uh, of uh, uh, the proportions of this mission is comparable in the robotic side to the Apollo program, okay? And uh, so the thing uh, landed. And uh, this is one of the first pictures he took. Um, 
uh, my EDL colleagues back in those days, when they saw those pictures, they almost passed out because despite their best intentions, you know, they, they mapped from orbit the landing sites and they picked the safest landing site and they landed very close to this they called Big Joe. And they, re they realized that they really got lucky, okay, that this thing could have just failed. And that the next time we go to Mars, we need to have some form of, of hazard detection to avoid landing on that rock. So that was, that was one of the first lessons from Viking, okay? And then, uh, then came the results, okay? And guess what? One of the results, one of the experiments that label release, uh, experiment gave positive, and this is the picture uh, that I collect. I went to a Viking reunion, and they, you know, they have all this stuff, and I took pictures. And then this is the actual plot of the, uh, uh, the, of the uh, uh, experiment uh, actually indicating life, okay? But, uh, the, the story goes that very soon, right, you know, the next day, they, they actually went through the formulas and they realized that you could explain that, that result of that experiment by a very uh, uh, complex chemistry of, of, of the so in the soil of Mars due to the, 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 the radiation and the uh, ultraviolet you know, radiation actually creating very, very reactive uh, chemistry. So then they actually said, no, there's no life. And on top of that, the organics instrument supposed to, you know, if, if we are looking for life as we know it, you, have, you should find organics, and he found zero, okay? So that was a big letdown, right? And uh, here's the great Carl Sagan. Uh, Gentry Lee, uh, that is, was one of the members of, of Viking, one of the main members, was very young back then, and still at JPL. He's a chief engineer for the Solar Sister Exploration uh, Program, uh, and good friend of Carl Sagan. He tells us that they, they so much believe that they were going to find life, not only just microbial life, but actually, you know, complex life, that Carl Sagan wanted to put a light at, so then at night they could actually take pictures of the, 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 the little bugs moving around, okay? So when they did not find that, then pretty much killed <laughs> the Mars exploration prog program for 20 years, which was great for me because that gave me time to finish high school, go to college. <laughs> and then uh, go to JPL. And, um, and just you know, a few years after arriving to JPL, the, the, Mars, uh, the astrobiology research of, 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 of Mars is resurrected by, with more uh, modest goals and a much more gradual approach. So the first thing is, well, the most, the most important things for life is water. So let's go in search of the water. This was called follow the water strategy, right? Uh, because the biological process is, requires water. But water is, is the greatest solvent, okay? So and you need solvents to move nutrients and to remove uh, 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 trash, uh, you know, being generated uh, uh, in, the, in the cells, okay? But it's also, ov obviously, water is very important in understanding the climate and the geology of Mars. And if in the future, if we want to go to Mars uh, and colonize it, we're going to need water. So follow the water became the... The, 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 you know, the big uh, goal of the Mars program, the resurrected Mars program. Uh, and the first lander under that was the Mars Pathfinder project. It started in the beginning of the, in the 90s. And uh, it was going to be a lander uh, with a you know, scientific station and a rover called Sojourner. Okay? Now, the problem with this is that there are two major challenges that we have to face. One is while Viking, that successfully landed on Mars, has $5 billion, we have $250 million here. So that was, the, it was part of the faster, better, and cheaper. And the second one was that Big Joe rock, you know, that was still in our minds. How are we going to deal with that? So it turns out that in this project, it was led by a whole bunch of mechanical engineers. So they looked for a mechanical engineering solution to the problem. So it was airbags. Hey, let's just put an airbag. And by the way, these airbags not only are great with dealing with Big Joe, but it's also they are cheaper because their theory of why things are complex is because, you know, guided navigation and control engineers like myself and Miran and, and Becha, you know, we, are, we, we use very expensive toys like radars and gyroscopes. So, and, uh, so actually, you could not mention the word gyroscope in a meeting because Brian Muirhead, Muirhead, the flight system manager, would actually kick you out. He said, no gyros in this mission. OK, fine. You know, so let's just put an airbag with bounces around, and that's cheaper. You can actually uh, uh, do it with uh, very cheap materials. And so that's what it was. But very quickly, they realized that the thing wasn't going to be that simple. 
the terminal velocity under the parachute was 60 meters per second-ish, and the airbags could only stand 12 meters per second, so they had to put retro rockets, okay? And uh, uh, solid retro rockets that you will fire in the last second, right, right before a uh, touchdown, and stop the spacecraft, and then you bounce around. And, uh, and in order to, inf you know, to learn when to fire these retro rockets, you need a measurement of altitude. In the beginning, they wanted to do the mechanical thing with a big blob and a sensor. It had to be like 100 meters long. So they finally, they decided to put a, a, an altimeter, and they called the GNNC guy. So that's how we got involved on that stuff. And the sequence is, you know, it, 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 similar to Viking. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it was a ballistic entry. Uh, we opened the parachute. The, then with the radar, uh, we computed the altitude and velocity to figure out the moment exactly, you know, first to inflate the airbags, and then the exact moment to fire the retro rockets and cut the bridle and then bounce. Okay? And that, that worked, you know. It was successful to our surprise because very difficult system to test. And um, this is one of the first pictures that he took, which is Twin Peaks. Here we can see the, the Sojourner. And the airbag has to be retracted before you open the pedals. The vehicle is protected by pedals. And then um, here's Sojourner doing his job. Another thing that they learned from Viking was the scientists were very, very frustrated uh, when they, because it was a static lander. So they could see these rocks and those geologic materials, and the robot arm could not get there. So they said, we need to, we need to have wheels. And the Russians have experimented that, the Soviets, on the moon, but the United States have never put a, a, a rover vehicle in another uh, place. And uh, so this is the first time, and it was a tremendous success. Okay, the, the scientists said, we cannot go back to, to, to Mars you know, without having mobility, being able to go from place to place. Because not all the materials on Mars are interesting. Some are just volcanic rocks, you know, that is, there are very little inter scientific interest, in particular for astrobiology. So that was the other lessons learned. Then came Mars Climate Orbiter and Mars Polar Lander. Okay, now, this ha they were staggered. So we were working on Pathfinder, and this mission was actually was a competed thing, and uh, Martin Mariera won it back in those t days. Now he's Lockheed Martin in Denver, in Denver uh, Colorado won the, 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 the competition to build two uh, orbiters and two landers. Okay, the first one launched in 98, the, the pair of both. And uh, they, being the ones that developed Viking, and uh, they chose a different solution. Even though they have even less money than us, they are, they, I guess the, the mechanical engineers were not in charge of the mission or what, but they decided to do a Viking-style lander, okay, but super cheap. And, uh, well, bad news. They both failed. One was because of a, 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 the, the, the orbiter was a, an error in the units. And uh, if I can give you the story after that if you are interested. It doesn't, it's not as bad as it sounds. But the, the result was horrible. <laughs> and the other one failed, and it didn't have telecommunications during landing, part of it making it cheaper. So we don't know exactly, but touchdown detection was the, the official you know, uh, 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 you know uh, reason, okay? And essentially, they forgot to clean a, a state variable. So computer science 101, okay? So, so then the lab right now is in a big, uh, uh, the NASA is in a big uh, 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 quandrum, right? Because uh, the next missions to go to Mars is we're going to be two copies of these things for in 2001. So they decide that, okay, for, for the orbiter, we know what happened. It was a silly, you know, problem with the units, and we know how to fix it. The other one, there was a whole host of problems with that design, okay, because they did it so much on the cheap. So then they decided to send that one, mothball that one, sent to the Smithsonian, right? And they'd say, well, what was the last thing that worked? Well, it was Pathfinder, okay? So let's use a Pathfinder landing system, but instead of having a stationary uh, a, a scientific station, let's and, and a rover separately, let's just put wheels on the scientific station. So you can put a much bigger rover, and now we can really, while well, Sojourner proved the concept, now we can really have this mobile scientific uh, payload. And that's what um, uh, uh, um, MER, the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit Opportunity, shows. you can see now that there is no station, there's just the rover all folded in, you know, in a million pieces, extremely complex, 
just the, the egress of this vehicle, just standing it up and deploying all these things, had more risk, people don't talk about that, than the actual sequence that landed you. Okay, so um, this simple uh, airbag system, it ain't so simple, you know, when you get into the nitty gritty of things. And um, also, and the idea was outside the pyramid that protects this is going to be heritage. That's the big word in NASA. So then it's, everything is going to be cheap and low risk. Guess what? The moment that we, that, that we sold this to NASA and we start building the mass of these things starts increasing, the volume, all of a sudden, everything starts changing. All of a sudden, our airbags starts doing this. This is the test of the airbag. We do it in the largest vacuum chamber in the world, Sandusky, Ohio, part of Glenn Research Center. And um, big hole right there. OK. And, uh, and by, by the way, this is all empirical. There's no simu I mean, they try to have some simulation codes to try to un understand why it does what it does. But in reality, they just play, you know, and they in increase the number of, of, uh, of layers of, of, of airbags, and they try again. They change the, the stitching, you know, on that. I, I said, well, you have to get out of the garment industry, because really, this was not, <laughs> it didn't feel like an engineering operation. And in, in some of the, uh, in one of the desperate, and I would say futile attempts at understanding the physics of this thing, they created this weird, you know, this is like a plastic dome with a camera underneath to actually be able to see the dynamics of how an airbag uh, interacts with the surface. And as you can see, it's not pretty. Okay, and so in essence, now you design a system that is simple, an airbag is just simple, but you just move the complexity to the interaction of that system with the terrain that you cannot predict what it is. You don't know what you're gonna touch down, okay? So that was, you know, so that was the first thing, like, oh my gosh, you know, we were coming from two failures, okay? So we were in bad shape. On top of that, there was this little thing that we neglected to tell people that about a, an Achilles heel about the entry, descent, and landing system of Pathfinder, that it, essentially that, that system was susceptible to winds, right? Uh, this, the, the, these, the, the retro rockets that we fired to slow the, the vertical velocity uh, are predicated, uh, they are passive, so they align themselves with a gravity vector like a pendulum. So if your vertical velocity, if, if there's no wind and the parachute trims at zero, then everything is nicely aligned. But guess what? There are winds, and there are two effects. One is you get a wind gas right a few seconds before touching down. So then now the vehicle is at, at an angle relative to the vertical, so then you give it a big whack, horizontal whack, which is as simple as the delta V times the sine of that angle. It's as simple as that. And that is a large value, by the way. And the other one is that you can have a steady state wind, so the whole column of wind is going, and that also adds to that. So those two components, the induced velocity and the steady state wind, gives you an horizontal velocity, that can bust your airbags. The airbags can, you know, uh, we, f we think that they can get up to 20 meters per second. In our Monte Carlo, we have cases of 35 meters per second, okay? But in Pathfinder, it was okay because it was faster, better, and cheaper. It was, you know, take risks. And also, we were using a, we felt that we were conservative on the wind models. We were using the wind model, uh, models from Cape Canaveral. You know, when people say, why are you using the Cape Canaveral winds? You say Mars winds as well. When we ask the scientists, which are the ones that complain, you say, well, give us Martian winds. So we don't have any. So then we ended up using the Cape Canaveral winds, and we thought they were um, conservative. So then when we brought this to the projects, you know, then we went back to the scientists, and the scientists this time said, well, we have something that we can use. Several universities got involved. And uh, essentially, they use the global winds uh, uh, that are actually well understood. And then having a model of the, of the topography, you can actually uh, understand now the interaction with the topography and the winds, and actually generate winds for the local landing site. And when we did that, we generated a statistic model of the winds. We put it on the system, and guess what? It was actually worse than Pathfinder. So they told us, fix it. Do something about it. So that something about it was, first we added three little rockets, the transverse input rocket system, 
one, two, three, in the back shell. We put a gyroscope in the back shell. <laughs> We're back in the game now, big time. So then we can actually sense the angle, and if we, you know, it's, you know, it's a predictive system, and if, and if, we, if we sense that we, and, and if, if we sense that we have an angle, we fire the, the rocket, and such that during the firing of the, of the solid rocket booster, the ones that kill the vertical velocity, the mean of that motion is closer to zero. It's really not ever near our system. It's really just to bring from the 30 meters per second to 15 meters per second. It's very um, uh, coarse, but good enough to bring you within the airbag uh, 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 envelope. Now, for the steady state wind, what are we going to do? Because this one, you just put a gyroscope and you know, put on a length 200, not very expensive. For the horizontal velocity, usually you need, you need to use a Doppler radar. And there was no off-the-shelf Doppler radar that, you know, that we could use. The Phoenix one, the, the Mars Polar Lander one, it was not something that, that we wanted to use. So we ended up um, using a camera. Okay, so this is actually the first use, many people don't know this, of terrain relative navigation in another planet. We actually have a camera, and we took three images, and by, by tracking the features image to image, we were able to compute the horizontal velocity. By the way, we, we chose to do this. It was a, a, it was a, a, a chance encounter with Rob Manning, which is a, a, an engineer at JPL, also a fellow. And Miguel said, Miguel, you know, we need to get a a radar for, you know, to solve our problem. So, well, you know, we don't have any radars. And then I said, well, but you just put a camera and take three images, and we can compute velocity. And I was actually on my way to Argentina for a wedding. When I came back, I, I found out there was a team of 10 people working on this a week later. And this was like a year and a half before launch. So it was done in it very fast. Okay, and guess what? So we put it in, and, uh, and and there was a big discussion whether we really needed to do this. This is a big distraction. You are reducing the probability of success as opposed to increasing it. It was actually very, uh, uh, you know, difficult times. You know, we, we were kind of wondering, are we doing the right thing or are we doing the NASA over-engineering everything thing? Was, guess what? Landing day came in. This is spirit landing. This is a reconstruction, so this is from actual telemetry. And uh, this is the motion of the full stack you know, as interacts with the winds. And it did both things activated. Essentially, we have both steady state wind, and on top of that, we get a wind of gas. You're going to see that the system is going to move to the right. And then you're going to see a little rocket that pushes to the center. And these are the predictions of velocity. I forgot exactly what it is. But um, so I believe that this is where we are getting the gust of wind. And then you're going to see the little rocket here activate. And, and it brought the velocity from about 26 meters per second, or it's predicted because we don't know, to within 15 meters per second. So it was a, you know, it, at, it, at the end it was worth the trouble, right? And it was a big success. Opportunity landed three weeks later. And just like we expected, our wind model said that there shouldn't be that much wind on, on, on the place where. Uh, uh, um, I can't remember now uh, the, the place where uh, Opportunity landed, and, and we didn't encounter that much wind, and the system did not activate, which is fine, okay? So because we got one to do the right thing for both cases. So, um, and this is the reconstruction of the spirit landing, uh, same telemetry, but uh, also the reconstruction of the bounces. So then you get a feeling of, what, this, this, what, what it does. So the system, it's, it's already finished entry, and it deployed the parachute. It has an accelerometer to uh, compute, you know, the right acceleration it opens the parachute, not too early, not too late. Now the radar is computing, is, is measuring altitude, and we have an estimator to compute altitude and velocity to time exactly the moment. And again, this is exactly as it happened on Mars, the best reconstruction we could. And you could see here the little rocket firing in the last second. And then the thing stops six meters over the ground and cut the bridle. And it lands, and it lands again, and again, like for two kilometers and two minutes, right? Every time that it bounces, there's a chance that there is a little sharp 
rock and it gives us a bad day. So we are celebrating, but we know that we shouldn't be celebrating through these things, through these bounces, because, it, you know, so, uh, and we never know when to celebrate here because it's, it's, it needs to come to a stop and the signal is coming in and it's going out, it's going around, it's like, and actually when Spirit landed, I mean, we were in the middle of celebration, the signal went out and it took like 10 minutes to come back. So we saw, well, we, we, we popped the, the champagne a little too early. And, um, and believe it or not, it actually landed between the two, um, at the edge of the airbag, which is what are the chances of that? And uh, so that's, you know, that's, that it works. You know, I mean, you can argue with success. I mean, I, to be honest, I hated this system, right? Because you have all the disadvantages of a, an active system where you have radars and, you know, cameras and rockets but without the advantages of an active system where you can actually control your situation, you're still at the mercy of, of, of the terrain. And uh, so it's, you know, I, you know, by then, even the mechanical engineer friends have lost their um, love for airbags, right? But it didn't matter because now, uh, this is the, the, the uh, picture of the uh, uh, opportunity that just happens to land inside a, a little crater. And uh, these rocks, by the way, uh, immediately, when they, one of the first pictures, the, the geologists were just jumping because it was very clear that this like, type of sedimental rock that they were looking for, okay, because they, that they form in the presence of water. So anyway, so at this point, we're happy that it worked, but we need to land this, okay? I mean, it's, uh, it's the size of a Mini Cooper, right? I mean, it's almost a ton, right? And... Um, and when you compare it to the previous one, it's a big jump, right? And because again, I mean, every time you do these things, you, you want to do something better than the last time. You carry more instruments, and it, and it keeps growing, right? And uh, uh, so we needed to figure out a way how to land this, OK? And we looked through, um, uh, and not only land a big payload like that, but this, the scientists wanted us to reduce the size of the landing ellipse, because uh, the landing ellipse you need to find a place to land that is scientifically interesting and safe for the landing, okay? We, our technology doesn't allow, because of big job, right? We cannot go everywhere. So we put restrictions, engineers, engineers put restrictions on the landing site characteristics, like slopes and rock, uh, rock abundance. They said we, we can have this probability of finding a rock of this size that can damage the rover, okay? So the smaller the size where we put these requirements, the easier it is for the scientists to find a place that is scientifically interesting and safe, which is a process, by the way, that lasts many years. And there are rooms like this with scientists from all over the world where they argue, uh, and, uh, and sometimes not very scientific. You know, they vote, right? And, uh, and uh, there's a professor who brings the whole students, and they vote for his landing site. <laughs> and we are the engineers in one corner they are saying, just tell us where you want to go. So in any case, so. We wanted to reduce the landing size so the scientists can pick a place like this one, which is the, the place that they pick. It's called Gale Crater. Uh, it's a crater of 150 kilometers diameter. It has a mountain in the center, Mount Sharp. And, uh, and the science is in that mountain, because it's the, they, they can see the, these levels of stratigraphy you know, and, 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 and uh, geological materials that they believe that uh, they were uh, clays that they were formed in, in, you know, in the presence of water. So, uh, and this is the safe place to, that they could find. So kind of between a rock and a hard place, right? Because we have a mountain on one side and we have the rim of the crater, both you know, would be automatic death, right? And uh, you can see here the comparison of the different landing ellipses through the years with, this, with uh, the Gale Crater. And you can see how Viking, which they didn't even know, very well the density of Mars, which you need to know because you're using the, the, atmospheric, uh, the, the atmosphere to slow you down. So they have a huge landing ellipse. And then as we know more about Mars and about navigation, we keep reducing it. But to get to this, to this small size, we need to do something better. We need to do active guidance. So this is the first use of active guidance on Mars. And I'll say a little bit more ne next. So very quickly, what we call the seven minutes of terror, uh, uh, the vehicle uh, uh, arrived to uh, Mars uh, traveling at 20,000 miles an hour, uh, excuse me, 20,000 kilometers an hour, 
uh, when it hits the upper layers of the atmosphere, which is about 125 kilometers, then in seven minutes, a vehicle has to be on the surface uh, you know, per, you know, with zero velocity. And there are three stages of, of braking uh, uh, that the vehicle goes through. The first is entry. That's where 99% of the energy gets dissipated as heat uh, with a capsule, you know, just using that friction with the air. And this is where we do the, the, uh, the entry guidance. Then we have the parachute that it opens uh, about 10 kilometers of altitude at supersonic speeds. That's a big deal. 1% uh, of, the, of the energy gets uh, dissipated there. And then finally, it just, it just happens that the, par the, the atmosphere of Mars is only 2% the atmosphere of Earth. So it's too thin. So the vehicle, even with a big, pretty big parachute, is still dropping at 300 kilometers an hour. So we need to have some, just like MER had these solid rockets, we need something else. And this is uh, the, the, uh, 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 the same, actually, engines. It's, it's a propulsive uh, landing, soft landing. And they are the same engines that uh, the Viking used, the, you know, that they were resurrected. Thanks, Roger. Uh, 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 by Aerojet General. And uh, OK, so that's the third. So very quickly, I'm going to touch all of these three stages. So the first one is the entry phase. Big capsule, 4.5 meter diameter. The bigger the area, the better, because you slope more. And, um, uh, again, the comparison with a Mini Cooper. You know that uh, 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 the Mini Cooper, BMW, the owners of Mini Cooper, the Mini Cooper brand, they complained. They, said they, they, they contacted JPL officially. They said, we cannot con use these biographs anymore. And uh, after curiosity, for some reason, that uh, restriction suddenly, suddenly disappeared. So at least so they haven't complained to me. So. Um, and then the, um, the heat shield is, is, is a pica you know, material, phenolic, impregnated uh, car carbon ablator developed at Ames. You know, the trick here, it has to you know, be able to survive the heat of entry. And it needs to be light, right? Because every kilogram that you put here is kilogram that you cannot travel, you cannot put in your instruments. The, uh, so let's talk a little bit about ballistic entry, which is lifted entry. Um, all the previous missions to Mars um, with the exception of Viking, but I, I'll mention that uh, Pathfinder, uh, uh, Mars Polar Lander, Phoenix, and, uh, and the, the MER rovers, they were ballistic entries. So that means that the center of mass is in the center of the, of the axis of symmetry. So the, the vehicle trims as the velocity is aligned with the axis of symmetry. So it's ballistic because really it does the same uh, trajectory of, 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 of a bullet or a rock, if you throw a rock. So you, there's no control. So you aim very well, you know, where you want to land with all the dispersions and understanding of your atmosphere, the density and winds, and hopefully it lands on the right place. So that's why you have a large ellipse. And there's no controlling that you can do. In a lifting entry, you shift the CG off the uh, axis of symmetry, so that creates an angle of attack. So now the, the velocity is, uh, vector is not center, uh, it's at an angle. That's what an angle of attack is. And now you generate a lift vector. In addition to your drag, which is you're using to slow down, you generate a lift vector, just like a wing, right? So now you can actually, with thrusters, you can point that lift vector, and now you can control your position and reduce the landing ellipse in closed loop, OK, uh, using a, a, a guidance algorithm. So it's a very poor wind. A wing, right? Uh, the a lift to, you know, the lift to drag ratio is horrible. It's, it's more like a flying brick than I would call it than a wing. But it's, in, in principle, it's a wing. Viking actually did have a lifted entry, but they only flew lift up, okay? And they did that to, you know, because they were afraid that they were going to run out of altitude to slow down. So it was done only for that purpose. And since they didn't understand the atmosphere of Mars at Mars, they needed to build that up. But here's the first time that we used that lift and we modulated it by banking left and right and uh, to actually control both our out of track, our in track um, uh, position. And the algorithm that we used is actually is based on the Apollo project uh, guidance algorithm that used, brought the, 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 the astronauts from the moon and, uh, and is uh, pretty standard, it's a predictor corrector. Uh, it's very simple, actually, and it works extremely well. And I had, you know, we had the pleasure of working with engineers that actually developed this for Apollo that since then have passed away. But, uh, but they, they gave us their, 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 their knowledge. 
I, I can talk to you know, anybody that's interested. We, you know, I don't have the time to go through this now, uh, but it's a very simple uh, algorithm, and uh, we implemented it, and voila, it worked pretty well. We landed within two kilometers. And it was very controversial that the first time that we used this technique, we actually use it to go to have access to these places. Some people say, no, you should use this technique and go to a place that is nice and flat. And, uh, but actually, I give credit to, to NASA and uh, JPL for having the courage to say, no, if we're going to develop this, we're going to use it. And this is like the, this is a poster you know, child case of the, of the use of this technology, right? And this is when we are looking at how we uh, engineers want to build technologies that then they get used in, in missions, real missions, this is a perfect case where we actually, the Guns Navigation and Control community, we, we went to the scientists and says, you guys want this. And, uh, and, and that was a big success, and now our next missions is gonna, are going to have it too. So um, the next stage is all about parachutes. Uh, it's a larger supersonic parachute. You can see here a person standing. It's 50 meter long. Um, we, one can talk for hours about parachutes. It's not my area of expertise. The only thing I can tell you is not anybody's area of expertise. <laughs> They're still pretty much uh, very complex machines. We, we love them. We have a love-hate relationship with these things, right? Because uh, they do a lot for you. Uh, they slow you down using very small volume and mass, okay? The problem is that the whole physics of, of, of how these things open and how you compute the structure uh, so that it doesn't, they don't break, especially when you, you're opening at supersonic speeds. We don't have the theory, so we don't have the, the fluid dynamic codes that you can design. You have to empirically test it in those conditions, okay? And every time that we do a test, we actually realize that we know less than we thought we knew. So it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. And Mars, we are trying to solve this for Mars 2020. Again, but anyway, I'm going to move on because this is the, the, perhaps the most interesting stage because I'm Gin and C guy, that, and there's a lot of Gin and C here, so, which is the power descent phase. So the problem here is how do you land uh, you know, a vehicle of this size, right? So we, we looked in, in multiple uh, solutions, right? We even looked at uh, airbags. I mean, uh, Tom Rivellini is the, the, the father of the uh, Pathfinder and MER airbags. They even attempted to say, well, we can put airbags. Didn't pass the last test, at least not mine, right? The issue is, well, we just land, you know, like the lunar module land, you know, with three legs, you know, you have the engines in the bottom. What's wrong with that? Well, the, what's wrong with that is that now you have a vehicle, a vehicle that is one meter from the surface. And that's a tough meter to negotiate, right? So be, because, you know, you cannot fit metallic ramps inside the, the, um, the, the capsule. There's no room there. Uh, you can do uh, airbags, inflatable ramps, but then there might be rocks around, and so that's... And also, it has a problem that this thing can land on top of Big Joe, right? So, th th because there's no clearances, because they have all the engines. So, it's, 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 a, you know, it's an annoying problem, because you, you, you do this, you know, millions of kilometers to get to Mars, and then you fall short by one meter, right? So, then we looked at all sorts of, you know, uh, crazy ways of solving this problem until we stumbled upon the sky crane, right? which for people that haven't been you know, going through the intellectual journey, if you jump to this, things, this is crazy and maybe silly idea, but once you go through the airbags and all that, you, you, you end up here. So here we say, well, let's just, put, let's just do what a helicopter does. We put the engines on top, and we, you know, we suspend the rover through three bridles, and we just land it on its wheels, ready to go to work. Okay, so that's, that became the sky crane. And here's another artist rendition of the sky crane. And um, it was an interesting, you know, how do we get there? Some people, you know, ask us, what was the, the mental evolution? Well, everybody has a different story how we got there. But I, I, this is my view of it. Uh, you know, we, we have gone through, again, this intellectual journey with, you know, Viking was a soft lander. And then we have actually done that. If you look at this, this uh, the rockets are here. There's a rope, and then there is the lander. So we kind of were doing this, and we actually got very comfortable with the three-body dynamics of this system. We knew how to predict it. We knew how to model it. So the other thing we had to do is actually put, instead of these impulsive rockets, put Viking-style throttable engines, put a three-bridle system, and put a good radar. So now we can lower the velocity at touchdown so that you can land, you can get rid of the, back, of the, of the airbags, essentially. You, you already, if you have the rockets, you have the radar, 
Just make it a little better, so then reducing the touchdown velocity so you can land on, on the wheels, get rid of those. So I believe that this was the intellectual journey that brought us to this world, okay? And, and, and this is, by the way, a simulation. This is not, an, it's an animation of a simulation. It's just to give you an idea, the powerful of this, the power of this uh, simple idea, um, which is don't let the system go until it's fully on the surface. In a three axis double, in a regular touchdown system, you would stop the thrusting the moment that the first molecule of rover would touch down, and then it would just go blam. Here you keep holding it, right? Because the engines are up there, they are decoupled of all the activity that is taking place as this thing is interacting with this complex terrain, okay? So just deposit it slowly, and then you cut and you go away. This is something that any uh, a crane operator in any dock will know. Don't drop the cargo until the thing is. So we actually found a lot of properties about this landing system after we sold it. It was kind of interesting. It's, it's the opposite of a lot of architectures, like the airbags, that there's a honeymoon stage where you love the architecture, and then you start finding that, oh, crap, what, you know. <laughs> this is not working so well. This was a, a reverse honey, honeymoon where things were actually, the more we knew about it, the, more, the better we loved this thing. All the way to landing, actually. And um, another thing that, 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 made the, the, that this architecture allow you to do is very simple touch and detection. Remember that people were traumatized with the failure of Mars Polar Lander because it seemed that the touch and detection it, it, it did it to us, right? In this case, you're just telling the, the control system to go down slowly, right? And then the controls, you know, using the inertia measurement unit, uh, um, keeping a constant velocity, when the vehicle touches down, you drop essentially half of the weight of the system. So the throttle settings, they go down to, to half as much automatically. So just by monitoring the throttle settings required to keep a constant velocity, there's your trigger. So it was like 10 lines of code and extremely robust because this is a big signal. And also, I don't, you know, we don't have to look at what the chaotic signal. Actually, we have a flatness test. We only pay attention to the signal where it was flat because we knew that it was going to be flat before and after. It was flat and below 50% we touched down. So it was super simple and robust. And um, so other uh, properties of this system is allowed us to, to essentially um, uh, decouple the design. This is actually kind of like a rocket. You know, it's a reverse rocket. You know, the, the builders of the rockets, they don't need to understand the payload on top. So that allows us to do that, right? I mean, be able to design a system. We, we have to know what's the payload mass, right? But, and what velocity they want us to touch down. So it allows us to decouple the design of the system, of the descent stage, and the rover, which is what you do in, on, the, on the launch vehicle, attempt to do. And then the other one is easy to analyze, because here, all the forces that are being applied to this is through the bridle, okay? So all the complex interactions we can test by just lowering the rover multiple times, but the, mathematically, we can, mathematically we can model the behavior of the descent stage. How am I doing? I have to hurry up a little bit. So for, for those that are controlled you know, uh, people, the, as far as, I mean, everybody was, oh my gosh, you're gonna go unstable in this thing, you know? It's, uh, you know, well, ended up that in, in, in an act of desperation, actually drew this on the wipe or tried. So the, the, the project manager said, there's no way I'm going to let you guys do this unless uh, a, a group of experts uh, uh, approves, you know, your, 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 your ideas. So he, com he asked the Aerospace Corporation to form a, a, a group of, 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 of experts to, uh, where we presented over a period of two days. And, uh, and, it, and, and they convened a very interesting group of people. They were a helicopter pilot. And the, the people that worked on the Delta, the, the first ones to land vertically, do you remember the Delta, the, the, it was a McDonnell Douglas, right? The Delta Star. The Delta Star. So they were there, Delta Clipper. Delta Clipper. And then there was a, a Harrison Schmidt, the, the last astronaut to walk on the moon, who, who loved it from day one. So it was a pleasure to, to try to defend this design in front of a person that walked on the moon. So, uh, so I, but my trick to try to sell, tell them, really, we are really not doing much. The, con the control is very simple, really. It's a PD controller, if you, if you might say, with a dashboard and a, 
and a, and a spring. So the energy, whatever oscillations of this system, just like a suspension system, it would be dissipated by, the, by that. So that's, th th that's what we were trying to do. This is not even the, the inverted pendulum, which is a typical problem that one solves in school. It was even simpler than that. And in, term in, in terms of, of <clears throat> control system theory, what we were doing, we were phase stabilizing those modes. That was it. It was very simple, very, very robust. We did need that the throttable engines could, could respond up to 15 hertz. So then we actually did a lot of work with you guys trying to make sure that we have high bandwidth uh, in, engines. You know, so that, so that's, that was the trick of it. So we were not scared about this control problem at all. It actually was fairly simple. And, uh, but they, they, they asked us to, to do uh, demos. You know, so we have this thing with a strain gauge, and um, it's embarrassing because this is a, you know, college, today high school kids would do this, right? But anyway, that's what they want us to do. Interestingly, it, it, it was the, the actual mode, the ones that it, it required a little bit of thinking, because in the beginning, we, we had a very stiff uh, bridle, it was a, a vectron, you know, because it's, oh, you need something stiff, right? Because it's strong. And it, and, it, and it would go unstable because we couldn't stabilize those poles. They were too high frequency. So then what we did is we actually, for the first time, we had the mechanical guy said, you have to make things rigid, but not too rigid. So we gave them a range of elasticity, right? So we had to slow down the plant so we can control it. Essentially, that's what it comes down to it. So we ended up flying a nylon uh, uh, bridle, which I have a picture. I have a piece, so then you can you guys check it out. It's just nylon. And uh, so that became a specification not to make it too stiff, okay? So then we can stabilize the plant. So anyway, so it's very simple. And then we had to get rid of the back, the, of the descent stage. That was a big pain, okay? Because we didn't want to land it closely or scratch it closely because we are afraid of the debris that would be generated, okay? And then so we had to crash it far away. So in the, but the problem is our... Robert, the only computer that controlled this thing during the landing and then after that, it was in the, in, on the rover. You know, we fought for a com our own computer in the descent stage. It was a dream of us to have our own computer. And they didn't give it to us for, for, for money, for uh, 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 budget reasons, right? So, so we looked at, into doing an open loop fly away, right? Just fire the engines a little bit more than the other one. And when you do the Monte Carlo, the, the, like a boomerang, some of them will come back and crash near you. So that didn't work. So then we, uh, we push more about give us the descent stage, uh, a smart descent stage, and that manages said, no, figure out a way. And unfortunately, we did figure out a way. And uh, we realized, well, the IMU is mounted up here. And we have a servo control system to control the throttle valves of the, of the Viking era engines. So let's just, and that, you know, the, that motor controller, let's route the inertia measurement unit signal to that and have a very simple control law. And then we hired Betchett, that is, where is he? To do the control law. So that was uh, Betchett's uh, task in, in MSL, and he, and he is highly successful. And it was a very simple uh, a, 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 in, in principle, right? The idea, people were concerned about Oh my gosh, so well now you need to uh, get all the state information and move it to, to the descent stage. It's a very complicated uh, um, interaction between the two bodies, right? Between the two computer elements. So what we decided to do is no, it's going to be not an explicit, but implicit, or the opposite. I can never remember. In other words, the descent stage, the rover has an, an agreement with a little computer above there that I'm going to leave you horizontally, you know, at zero velocity. So when you say go, you have to assume that I'm horizontal and I'm, you, know, you can do whatever you want to do after that. So it's, there was no exchange of information. There was just a go, okay? And the control law was simply, it was an attitude control law. First to go straight up and then to do a pitch uh, in the direction where the thrusters are canted so not to plume the rover and then keep uh, an angle and fire the engines and then stop and crash. So it was, so it was the, the verification and the validation was very simple. So we, you know, we actually, I think that we came up with a very good uh, solution that Bedjet implemented. So, and, but it was expensive, you know. I mean, it was true that what the mechanical guys are saying. We are expensive. We need, you know, 
we needed to resurrect the Viking era agent, engines, and Aerojet General did it, and uh, uh, they were fantastic uh, technology to have back in, the, in our toolbox. Then we developed a, 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 for uh, a, this mission, a pulse Doppler radar, uh, KA band 35 gigahertz, uh, was a very painful, very costly design, but that's what you needed to do. You can see here that all the antennas uh, that we use for landing. And then um, we had to test that radar. It's not easy to test the radar through all these uh, uh, regimes of, you know, dynamic regimes. So, you know, we had to use uh, a tower in, in Channel Lake, you know, uh, that, that they use uh, for testing radar stuff, a helicopter. The helicopter, if it looked familiar, is because the helicopter of 24 hours, the TV series. And the pilots used to tell us about what's going to happen in the next episode. It was actually kind of fun. <laughs> and then we actually had to use an F-18 uh, uh, just to get the vertical velocities and the altitudes. And only one antenna in this case. Obviously, we could not test the whole system. And then, um, as far as the rest, we never tested the sky crane until Mars. Okay, it was the, the money required to do a, a full, you know, hot fire test could be used to retire other risks. So that our manager said, do you really guys, do you need to do a hot fire test? I said, well, it would be kind of nice. He said, okay, fine, no. And then <laughs> few, few days, the closer the days to, the, to, to, to enter the center landing, it would mm, be nice to have. Well, just imagine that if the sky crane had failed, right, and, and $2.5 billion, you know, whoever had to go testify in Congress, not me, uh, it was going to have a hard time because it would have been a $20 million maybe test, but over $2.5 billion. Anyway, we, but we did do things like this just to test, make sure that the bridles did not get, you know, hung with the, in the wrong places. And then we tested the rover multiple times just to uh, make sure that... And, and those are the types of velocities that we're dealing here, okay, to make sure that we don't bend anything. And uh, so we did that. We did the best we could without actually doing a, a, a hot fire test. Now, very quickly, it's interesting to see now the whole uh, journey that we did through in, in the velocity space. This is vertical velocity in the y-axis and horizontal velocity. So we started great from a GNC community, very soft lander. Then the mechanical guys and Pathfinder came in and said, well, let's just put an airbag. No retro rocket, so, um, the, uh, but now your touch and velocity, vertical velocity is too high. So, so we need to put these retro rockets. When we, did that, when we do that, we get Pathfinder. We reduce the, the vertical velocity, but we created an horizontal velocity. Then we added tiers and dimes in MER to reduce the horizontal velocity. Now, now we have here this system. It still has gyro, it has thrusters has airbags, all the worst of passive and active systems. So then here we decided to go back, to not only to go back to Viking, but actually to do a super soft lander, okay? Which, and then we ended up here, which is what the sky crane allow us to do with good radars and good, uh, uh, so we went the whole full, full circle, okay? So, and this is the day of landing. And uh, this one has audio. And the, um, the, 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 at this point, the thing we, you saw the heat chill is under the parachute. It's oscillating. But I'll let you know when it gets out of the parachute and it starts the propulsive landing. This is actual footage of the landing. So we had a camera, Malin Space Systems camera. It was a science camera. And, uh, uh, and we just took images. It was, not, it was not used for the EDL. It was just used to, to, for science. And obviously, outreach too. So by now, the radar is making its measurements and deciding the software, the trigger to start power descent. No, somebody on the, on, you know, actually in the internet, and people started getting these things and adding things to it, and they did fantastic stuff. Still on the parachute. There. The first thing the spacecraft does is, is actually 
does an evasion maneuver so that the parachute doesn't drop on top of the spacecraft or you drop on top of the spacecraft. So it's in the middle of the, it's under propulsion right now, closed loop. So now it's getting to the vertical, it's coming down. It's gonna pick some dust and you're gonna see the wheel deploy here. And then that's how uh, Curiosity landed and in August uh, 5th. And this is one of the first pictures and you can see uh, Curiosity with the wheel firmly on the surface of Mars and its shadow and then the, the, the mount uh, uh, sharp uh, in front of it. And um, a little uh, uh, icing on the cake, uh, we instructed MRO to take a picture of, of Curiosity. He said, take a picture in this direction at this time. We're going to be there. And actually, we, we, we were. It worked. And, and actually, fantastic picture. You could even see that this band gap parachute. And, uh, and this is the, the uh, picture of Mount Sharp. And this is the, 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 la the layer structure that I was telling you about that has all the science and, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, the, all the, the, the history of Mars that tells us whether, I, actually, the, 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 it, we didn't even have to get to, to Mount Sharp to actually find all the things that we wanted to, to, to find. Uh, Curiosity now determined you know, we, we, uh, that this place where we landed, it once contained a, a, a body of water up to knee, the knee. Uh, it was a neutral pH, so very favorable for life. And it encountered all the other elements of phosphorus and oxygen, nitrogen, all the things needed for life. So, so the next mission will, um, is Mars 2020. It's also sky crane. Uh, obviously, it has a different set of instruments. They are going now, finally, you know, now that we know that all the elements of life were there on Mars, now we're going back to doing the Viking thing, but not the same as Viking. And so <laughs> they're going to look for minerals, but they're going to look how the minerals are deposited in the rock. I mean, the way Curiosity does it, it drills and pulverizes everything, right? But it turns out just the structure of how those minerals are being deposited, they, you can tell something about uh, uh, what is, is of biological nature. So uh, they're going to take a core and then analyze it, okay, for those minerals. And also, those cores are going to be put inside a little metal container and dropped on the surface for a future mission to grab them and bring them back home. So then we can really analyze it. It's easier to bring the, well, it's not that easy, but it's easier to bring the samples to Earth and analyze it with all the instruments you have on Earth and bring all those instruments to, to Mars, okay? And then finally, last but not least, they are also doing uh, a, um, uh, a, a, we're gonna generate oxygen uh, from the CO2 to pr for, for future, you know, essentially what the Martian did in the movie. And, um, well, I don't have time, but there's a, if, uh, uh, we're going to use a, bit, a little uh, 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 an enhancement to, to the landing system. With, uh, uh, we're going to carry a camera to determine the position of the spacecraft relative to the landing site. And then we're going to have a map of safe places uh, that, uh, you know, painted in green to really land on those. We don't have enough fuel to bring it to the center of the lip, so to reduce the ellipse to 50 meters. We can't do that, not enough fuel. But what we can do is just have a, a map of good you know, places to land. And so then this relaxes even more the requirements on what, how good the landing site has to be. And that allows you to go even to more landing sites. Because really, science is dangerous. I mean, there are scarves and there are all sorts of ge geological features that the scientist wants to go to, but they are dangerous for the spacecraft. And last but not least, we might actually fly a helicopter in 2020. Uh, it has not been 100% approved yet, but it's almost there. And it's, this is not an easy problem, guys. I mean, this is because of the atmosphere. I, I didn't even know. Most of us thought that you couldn't do this. But somebody took the time and did the back of the envelope, so you, you can do this. Th those uh, 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 propellers are, uh, are rotating like a 3,500 uh, uh, RPM. It's, it's crazy stuff, but, it, but it's doable. And uh, so we're working on it. And um, anyway. I'm going to go now. The last thing is how uh, th this was our moment uh, <laughs> of celebration. Good. Um, how the landing of Curiosity was experienced in, throughout the, the United States. People gather in museums and, and uh, plazas, you know, to, to watch this. Uh, we use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere.
we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle is just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 vertices. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet shield sep has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Standing by for back shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane has started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Yeah! Well, that, that concludes my talk, and unfortunately, I ran over, so that I'm not sure if there's any time for questions. Or I'm going to be here for the rest of the day. So, Great, thank you. Uh, thank you.